what are pre-colonial foods? What were we eating before the influence of, of other peoples, you know? And what was our food systems like? What were we growing? What did we do for food preservation? Where did we get fats and salts and sugars? And I really thought about it through that um, indigenous lens and through that culinary lens of just trying to understand how were we surviving for, you know, countless generations, you know? My name is Sean Sherman. Um, I'm going to read to you guys a little bit about American history. Um, this book is Barnes' Primary History of the United States, uh, published in 1885. And I just think it's kind of uh, poignant because we're here to talk about indigenous peoples, indigenous cultures, indigenous foods. And I feel like if we have gone to school in America, we've learned very little about indigenous peoples, but I think this kind of book kind of says this by itself. Primary History of the United States, introduction. White people first came to this country from Europe. Vast forests covered the land. There were no cities, towns, or pleasant farms such as we see today. The only people they found living here were a wild race of men whom they called Indians. In the Indians, perhaps you may have seen some of these people. They were of reddish or copper color and dressed in a strange way. They like to wear beads, feathers, and other trinkets. In times of war, they paint their faces and make themselves look as fierce as possible. The huts or tents in which they live in are made of bark or skins, and they are called wigwams. Hunting, fishing, and war are the occupation of the men, and all the hard work is done by the women. No one knows where the Indians come from, but they must have lived in this country many hundreds of years. They do not look like any other people in the world. Possibly they first came from Asia. And then I want to skip ahead to our friend Columbus. Let's see here. One second. Columbus, supposing that the island, which was San Salvador, he landed on, on which he landed on was part of India. So he called the people whom he found there Indians. They were much frightened when they saw the ships, which they supposed to be great birds, and for some time hardly dared approach the white men who had come upon their shores. But the kindly manner of Columbus gave them courage. And they then welcomed the strangers and brought supplies of fresh fruit and food, uh, supplies of fruit and other kinds of food. Columbus and his men set up a great cross on the shore, and after giving thanks to God for their safe voyage, took possession of the country in the name of the royal patrons, the Spanish king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabella. I feel like, you know, <laughs> we haven't really come very far from the narratives that we that are here and this is this is 1885 right and i am you know i was born in 1974 and i feel like our history books weren't much better at all you know and you know and plus we're living in a time where a lot of indi black and indigenous histories are being taken off the shelves completely and reworded to basically be like this again you know so i just feel like we have an immense amount of work to do not only for our own understanding and our own education but for where we happen to live on this land, you know, and the true history of what has happened here. So I wanted to just share this with you um, the today, but I'm gonna jump into a presentation that I do quite a bit. I have got a lot of slides, so I'm gonna talk pretty fast and I move uh, pretty quickly, um, but uh, I think it's worth it. So give me a second while I switch mics because I can't, uh, I don't have a mobile mic thing. All right, so. Um, anyways, my name is Sean Sherman. I have a food company that I started called The Sous Chef, which is a play on words, obviously, because if you're in the culinary team or if you're watching a show like The Bear, then you understand that a sous chef is you know, kind of secondary in command. But for me, it was just a fun play on words. I just thought it was uh, tricky. And to date myself, I was using the email handle sous chef at Hotmail and sous chef at AOL. So <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was a funny, you know, a punny word. So I started that. But I grew up in South Dakota um, in the late 70s and early 80s. Like I said, I was born in 74. And, you know, and uh, 
South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. It's a massive space. And the last treaty we had the, with the United States government covered that whole area in orange. But after discovering gold in the Black Hills, you know, it gets shriveled down to that little yellow space in there. Um, and that's where we grew up. And, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s is loose for anybody, right? I feel like, you know, being raised by boomers, like their only, their only rule was just like, please stay outside until it's dark, you know? <laughs> and I, can, I, I found a video that pretty much sums up what it was like growing up in the 70s and 80s, and I'm gonna play that for you right now. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? I mean, come on, you know, like 10 p.m. <laughs> we can do better. And what were we doing at 10 p.m.? You know, we were staying safe. We were um, staying hydrated, of course, uh, the best we could, and, you know, keeping up with today, the date's uh, latest technology, you know. So, but, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, it made us a little tough, I feel like. It's just part of, part of what happened. And I started working at a really young age. I was 13 when I started working in restaurants. Um, and I uh, um, like barely turned 13, and I did that all through high school and college, and eventually I moved from, uh, Minneapolis, from South Dakota to Minneapolis, which is the homeland of the Dakota, the Anishinaabe, and Prince, and <laughs> I had a pretty good chef, chef career, and I learned a lot of styles of cuisine, um, but a few years into my career, I realized the complete absence of my own heritage. Like, there were no native restaurants out there. And like we're still in a world where that's kind of normal. Like we're in these big cities here, the capital of the entire nation. You can find food from all over the world here, but can you find food from the land that we're standing on? And it's extremely difficult to do that in any city, you know? And so uh, that epiphany to me like shot me on a path to try to understand why that was and what were Native American foods, you know? And trying to understand like indigenous foods in general and uh, you know, it just because there was no good way to do it, really. There wasn't like, uh, I mean, ChatGPT didn't exist quite yet. And so like I had to really dig backwards because I knew like I couldn't order Joy of Native American cooking online. And I just knew that things that I grew up with weren't really Lakota, like even growing up on the reservation. Like we had a few things, yes, not very many, but a few things. But most of the stuff that we had was not Native, and I knew that for a fact, you know? And so it sent me on a path to try and understand, like basically, what are pre-colonial foods? What were we eating before the influence of, of other peoples, you know? And what was our food systems like? What were we growing? What did we do for food preservation? Where did we get fats and salts and sugars? And I really thought about it through that um, indigenous lens and through that culinary lens of just trying to understand how were we surviving for, you know, countless generations, you know? And so, I started doing these talks, and I realized early on, too, that a lot of people didn't understand what uh, it meant for what pre-colonial foods were, pre-reservation foods are. So I'd just like to start from the beginning. So to understand what pre-colonial foods are, we have to understand what the term colonization is. What, what, is, what does it mean to be colonized, you know? What is, it, what, is, what, is colon, what is colonialism? So in order to understand colonialism, the best way to do it is just to Google it. So if you Google the term colonialism, you'll get the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying with settlers, settlers exploiting it economically, which is something that's not unique to North America, because this has happened all over the globe, and colonization is still active in many different forms, you know? And so for us, it was a matter of trying to understand how do we how do we go against that? And what does it mean to decolonize? So for me, it didn't mean trying to go backwards. I wasn't trying to pretend like colonization never happened, you know? I wasn't living in an alternate universe. We're living right now here today all together. So for me to understand what decolonization means to, to, like, to create a philosophy around it, it was just understanding the values that colonization has unfortunately normalized in our lifetimes, in our lives, in our lifestyles, you know? So values of colonization are imperialism, expansionism, capitalism, exploitation of natural resources, dehumanization of people of color, individualism, a focus on individualism, cultural assimilation, a scientific rationalism over lived experiences, and land ownership.
Um, when you compare that to indigenous communities and how, what kind of values were they living with, um, they were very community focused. They worked hard together um, for everything. You know, the land stewardship was really important to be a part of the land that we lived on. Community-based food systems, uh, reciprocity and sharing, oral tradition and education, um, which is important because I've listed it twice. Um, equitable consensus-based decision making, respect for elders, um, deep connection to land spaces, and a vast education of the plant world around us. You know, and there's many, many more pieces to this. But just as a just as an example of what are these values of things, you know, and so what are we actually doing? You know, and taking a look at where we happen to be, which is America, and understanding American colonization, which kind of takes on a form of its own after European colonization. So we have to remember how young we are as, this is, as the United States, because the United States formed in 1775, you know, in the very beginning, we're just a few states kind of hugged up against the shore, you know, and it's like, we're not ancient history here. Like, even in 1800, we're still basically these colonies, um, you know, Ohio is the western frontier during this time period. We're still at war with Great Britain. We're still, like, all these things are happening, and it doesn't take till the middle of that century till we actually start to form things, and the reality is that indigenous peoples are stewarding these land spaces. Many of them haven't even seen European people in this time period in history in 1800, and there's buildings obviously older than that around us, you know? So again, this is not ancient history for us to have forgotten about so much of it. And we don't officially, like I said, form the colonial lines that we see today of what is Mexico and, and, and United States until 1848 and the Treaty of Guadalupe. And this country was very aggressive against indigenous peoples from the very beginning. That's one of their very first documents, Declaration of Independence, labeling us as merciless Indian savages and dehumanizing us right away, which is part of the colonization situation. And so one of the very first things that was really harmful to us as indigenous peoples, because the main, the main value that we had as indigenous peoples um, as colonies started appearing on the East Coast was the land that we stood on. That was our value, not our human lives, not our community, not our education system. Systems, not our knowledge of agriculture, but just the land that we stood on because coloniz the people pushing colonization wanted the land that we stood on. So the Northwest Ordinance in 1787 is probably one of the harshest documents that happens to us because this is a document that justifies the theft of land spaces for the next up and still today, basically, you know. It pushes and uh, it, it just, you know, it creates a path for the United States government to really understand how to do that. So when you fly out east from here and you look out your plane window and you see this grid, that's part of the Northwest Ordinance. That's part of that justification of the United States government understood right away that if it was able to take over these land spaces, it could section it out, commodify it, sell it, and make a lot of money, which is exactly what they did. They stole millions and millions of acres from indigenous peoples over the next century, making an immense amount of wealth off of, the, off of these land spaces. And again, we have to remember how short time of history, because again, at, the, at 1800, very little of this land space is occupied by what the, by, by the colonizers on the East Coast. And again, the, the, the reality is in all these indigenous peoples, like this is a really harsh time period to be indigenous because we see a lot of policies happening in the United States government that makes, that just becomes more and more and more aggressive, especially after the Civil War. California wipes out its entire native population almost to extinction within a 20 year period in the 1850s and 1870s because of bounty systems where you could make upwards to $200 for the body part of an indigenous person during that time period, which is paid back from the state of California, which is also paid back to California from the United States government, so literally nationally sponsored genocide during the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. In 1873, they do a census in California and they count less than 14,000 people left alive after there had been hundreds of thousands of them at the beginning of that century. During this time period, we see an immense destruction of crops and seeds because there was an immense amount of agriculture happening in the United States. Uh, what is the United States at this time period? Especially on the, in these areas up here where there was just so much of it going on and so much advanced, like, um, culture happening, you know. It's not just this vance forest with a bunch of wild people running around bopping rabbits on the head, which is what our history books try to tell us, you know. There was advanced cultures going on out here. And, you know, so our very first president, George Washington, which is the namesake of where we happen to be, right, is one of his very first orders is ordering the total destruction and devastation of the settlements of all the tribes up here. Um, he, he wanted revenge for the, some of them siding with 
Great Britain, basically, at the time period, you know. So he sends General Sullivan out in 1779, and General Sullivan accomplishes this task within a single summer between May and September, and it's Sullivan's March, which you can read about. But because of that, there's a lot of books written about what happens during this particular march, and there's they're talking about like burning these huge townships down with, and there's massive agriculture going on, six miles of agriculture around these town spaces, you know. And there's just so much going on this time period, and they just burn everything down to the ground. And so at the end of that summer, General Sullivan writes back to George Washington, he's like, I've, I've fulfilled my duty. There's not a single side of an Indian on this side of Niagara um, within that single summer. So still today in Haudenosaunee language, the literal translation for the name for US president translates directly to town destroyer. You know, because of that recent history, that's not not long ago, and that sets the stage for what comes over the next century. You know, we have things like the Homestead Act of 1862, the Morrill Act of 1862, which also creates the land grant colleges and universities across the board, and it should really be called the land grab universities. The Dawes Act of 1887, um, and it just goes on and on. There's all of these things happening at a higher level that justifies the land, the land theft and the violence against indigenous peoples for that next century. Um, and, we, and it's so normal out there, like this is a flyer that was put up in Denver right before the Sand Creek Massacre, basically saying that anybody who signs up for this, for this situation, the whole company will be entitled to all the horses and other plunder taken from the Indians. So, you know, so it's predetermined that they're just gonna go massacre the, an entire village. And if you read about the Sand Creek Massacre, it's awful, you know, because they're killing not only men, but women, elderly people, children, and babies, you know? And it's just like, who does that? Like, that's insane. And so we see so much loss of food access to ourselves as, uh, as our regions get smaller and smaller, as the violence ramps up, as all of these things happen to us. If anybody's watched the recent Ken Burns documentary on, the, on American bison, he delves into this, how this is a very intentional act by the US government to, with the sole purpose of harming the indigenous communities out there that we're relying on a lot of this. Um, so kill every buffalo you can, every buffalo dead is an Indian gone, you know, and that's the sentiment that's carried out by Washington and the, and the military at this time period, especially after the Civil War. What was most harmful to us as indigenous peoples was the loss of our own education system. So if you take a moment to identify what is indigenous education compared to like what we have today. Indigenous education gave us the tools to live sustainably with the world around us. It gave us uh, the tools to understand how to pass down culture and know-how of everything. Star knowledge, language, just paying respect to the plants and the animal world around us, you know. Everything it was to be indigenous was our education system and that we started teaching our youth at a very, very young age. You know, so during the turn of the century, at, like my grandparents' era, at the turn of the century, they should have been downloading generations, you know, millennia of of wealth, a wealth of knowledge that should have been passed down to us as indigenous peoples. And instead, it's replaced with something completely different, just not that long ago. Again, a couple of generations ago for me. So this assimilation effort by the U.S. government, basically trying to take savages and turn them into civilized human beings, all this does is just create an in, in a really intense situation of trauma for these kids, right? So these kids, if you ever go to Carlisle, which isn't too far away in Pennsylvania, the very first Indian school, um, in boarding school, like this picture has hundreds of kids from many different tribes, and these kids are subjected to all sorts of trauma, because it's a uh, you know, mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and death. Like, there's a massive graveyard over there of all of these young Native children um, that sit outside Carlisle, Pennsylvania Indian School, which is now a war college for the U.S. military. You know, and these boarding schools happen all over the United States. And they happen all over the territories, and of course in Canada, as they're called residential schools. And if anybody's read the news in the past few years when they started like doing searches around some of the residential schools and finding massive amounts of unmarked graves around them of young children, you know, and it's a thing. Like there was a movie we just watched recently that's coming out with National Geographic called Sugarcane, which is the name of a community up in British Columbia, and it's all about one family as they're starting to uncover the history and finding out that like his dad is a part uh, is a, is an offspring of the priest and his mother when his mother was still a school-aged girl, right? And this was normal, and his dad was actually found right before he was thrown into the incinerator because that was something that was normal happening at that particular school. And like these kinds of things are part of our history that we don't talk about, that we should, and we haven't even started to unpack what happened with boarding schools in the U.S. yet. 
So if you do get a chance, look for that movie, Sugarcane, which will be coming around, probably streaming at some point this year. It's important. And because again, like we were forced to learn completely new languages, completely different new religions, dressed differently. Everything was taken from us of what it meant to be indigenous. And it wasn't a fun school. When I visited Carlisle, the historian said that one of the punishments they would give the kids is that if they got caught speaking their language or singing songs in their language would be brushing their teeth with pumice stone for minutes at a time, you know? And these are little tiny kids, you know? And this was how we were treating them back then. And then what does it mean to be indigenous across this next century, the 1900s? Like, it's still, nothing got really better for us, you know, which is why growing up on a reservation, we still didn't have access to our own foods. We still didn't have access to our own education. You know, we're not officially citizens until 1924, which is past my grandparents. I mean, my grandparents were very much alive during that time period before they were even considered citizens of where we live. And they also had to pass the Racial Integrity Act because they didn't have good uh, laws to discriminate against us at the time, which this helped put that into place, and it creates the Pocahontas rule. So white settlers who th who s were saying that they were that Pocahontas was in their family tree could be part Indian without having to be discriminated as as Indian, basically, is what this law says. Um, we go through a few decades of Indian termination and relocation policies. Uh, we go through a really intense Indian adoption era, which isn't talked about but should because during this time period, the statistic is one out of three Native children are taken from the hospitals and put into non-Native homes. So forced into, forced into these situations, you know? And that's, that's crazy, one out of three children during three decades. That's an immense amount of people and it's just another form of cultural genocide, right? We can't vote until 1965 like many people of color and it still makes it difficult because now things get gerrymandered around completely and a lot of our votes get lost in the mix because of the politics, right? We couldn't even celebrate our own religious freedoms until 1978, which is in my lifetime. And that's crazy because our country talks about freedom of religion for everybody. It just never applied until 1978, which isn't very long ago, to the first peoples of this nation and this continent. So where are we at today, post-colonial Native America, you know, and like, you know, colonization hasn't died. It's still out there, active in many forms. And I'm a chef, and people always want to know, like, what did you eat growing up? Because, you know, you grew up on a reservation, and they want to hear the fun stories. Like, well, I'd get up in the morning, I'd fashion a bow, and I'd take down an elk, and, you know, we'd gather a bunch of berries along the way. And that's the story they want to hear, but that's not the reality of it, because the reality of it is it, we grew up in a colonized state. We grew up with government commodity food program foods. And you know, it's great right now because we have amazing people working at the USDA making big changes for the first time in a long time. Um, but there's still a lot of harm that has come from this because a lot of these foods are not native, obviously, you know? Because when I was growing up, like what was I eating growing up? It wasn't native food, you know? It was just like what we had around the house. It was over-processed food that just wasn't good for us, you know? And things like beef with juices and chicken with juices and, you know, whatever. It's just like whatever with juices. I don't know. Like it's just <laughs> not great for us, right? So that's why it's important to think about things differently. Think about like what are true Native American foods and why don't we have Native American restaurants in every single city representing all this amazing tapestry of beautiful diversity across the board, right? Because in North America is an amazing biodiverse region and there's so many different kinds of plants and animals that live across that, but humans too and cultures. And one way to see a diversity of cultures across this continent, knowing that indigenous peoples live from every region from tropic to arctic, you know, look at language maps. Look at the indigenous language maps of where we happen to live. And there's so much diversity there. And just imagine a world where we could drive across this continent in any direction and experiencing all that beautiful diversity. And there's no reason to not, you know. It's unfortunate that we have a restaurant in Minneapolis, Minnesota called Awamni that features native foods. And it shouldn't be so rare to find a Native American restaurant at all, right? Because um, in Canada, we've got 634 tribes, 576 actually, I think, in the US. I think this is older. I can't remember. That number changes sometimes. 20% of Mexico identifies as indigenous. There's a lot of indigeneity, you know? And it doesn't matter who's speaking Spanish, English, or French. Those are European languages, all of them. Those are foreign languages to this land space, right? It's really important to understand the basis of what is indigenous diversity that's out there. And so for us, like, we just want to help make more indigenous education available to all of us. It could really benefit everybody, whether you're indigenous or not, to understand how people who had lived here for thousands of generations had figured out how to live so sustainably with this continent using what's around us, right? 
So indigenous knowledge is all of these things. It's wild foods, permaculture, agriculture, seed saving, oceanography, hunting, fishing, um, whole animal butchery, um, mycology, salt, sugar, fat productions, crafting, land stewardship, cooking techniques, metallurgy, history, star knowledge, medicines, food preservation, fermentation, nutrition, health, spirituality, gender roles. There's so many things that's a part of indigenous histories and indigenous educations that we could be making a part of everything, you know? I tease that our kids can name more Kardashians than they can tree species right now because that's what we teach people, you know? We need to be so much more just focused on what our education system really is and really more in tune with things and not trying to wipe away black and indigenous histories because it's out, out of comfort, you know? History is always going to be there. You can try to manipulate and change it, but it doesn't change it. It's just there for what it is. So we have to teach about it, right? So, and then food knowledge is amazing. We should be very proud of the foods that came from the Americas that are now normalized in so many countries all across the entire world, right? So much of our beautiful foods are out there. Like, what would Northern Italy be without tomato sauce and, and polenta? And what would Belgium, Belgium be without chocolate, you know? Things like that. Like, we take for granted that so many of these foods came from the Americas first. And there's so many benefits of understanding indigenous diets because we have so much healthier fats, uh, more diverse proteins, low carbs, low salts, immense plant diversity, organic agriculture. We celebrate cultural and regional diversity and regional and seasonal based food systems, you know. So let's look at food for two seconds. Um, proteins are an easy one because we are, you know, like one thing we do learn in schools is that Native Americans, it's a very generalized lesson plan that we like, Native Americans use every part of the bison, you know. Um, but that's because we were resourceful. We didn't have the privilege to be wasteful. We didn't like throw, buy something and throw it away Im immediately right after that. All we do is create trash, you know. Everything's just packaged to make trash everywhere we go, and that's all we do. So we, of course, we used every part of the bison because we had a vast education system of what to do with everything. Everything had a purpose, you know? But we use the same thing, not just for bison, but for any animal and plants. Like, we just figured out what to do with all the byproducts because we, did, again, didn't have that privilege to be wasteful. And so we shouldn't be afraid of things if it's not a cow, a pig, or a chicken, because those things didn't even exist on that. And so like when we opened up our food business in Minnesota, we just took away those colonial ingredients. We stopped using cow, beef, and chicken to showcase all this other beautiful protein diversity, you know? And it's totally doable. And so there's a lot of seafood out there and shellfish and even insects, you know? If you ever go down to like Oaxaca in Mexico, there's so much beautiful insect usage and the insect proteins that are available for everybody on a daily, and they taste great, you know? And you can make things taste good. And again, you shouldn't just be afraid of things just because, again, it's not a cow, a pig, or a chicken. And what really connected me with my past was plant knowledge, because if we're looking at plant knowledge, like we should see that there's so much beautiful plants that the Western diet's completely ignored across this whole continent, you know? Most of the things in the grocery stores aren't even from here, right? So we have to really think about how can we utilize this land space so much better? And what were, you know, what were different tribes in different regions using as, as uh, how did we get energy and pieces like that? Because we need carbs or fat. You know, this is a picture of Timsel, a wild prairie turnip that we grew, still used today in parts, but it's harder and harder to find because it basically used to grow everywhere the bison were, was, was, were. And since the bison were almost completely decimated, like, and in barbed wire fences and cattle ranches and a land ownership and all these things happen to the land space, like, some of these beautiful things start to disappear and become harder and harder to acquire, right? Um, camas root in the Pacific Northwest, wild rice in the Great Lakes region, just that vast knowledge of water plants anyways, you know, because like if you're on the coastal areas, you have a whole other food source right off the shore, and people have been utilizing those, that knowledge for, you know, countless generations. Or if you're in the desert areas where all the plants look like they want to hurt you and maim you, like it's just, there's so much amazing food, and it's almost silly to use the term food desert because indigenous peoples living in the desert saw nothing but food around them because they knew how to look at the world differently, right? So agriculture is another piece we should talk about more, especially indigenous agriculture, because we're kind of taught that we're kind of at the epitome of what is of industrial agriculture today. But this is dangerous. We know what this is doing to our soil. We know how much water this is taking. We know all the chemicals that's going into this, and it's getting into everything. We can't even get away from this stuff it's, if you're eating processed foods at all, which is basically the entirety of the inside of your, the middle part of your grocery stores, you know? And so like if we see things like, how worried should we be that glyphosate was found in our Cheerios? Like, you should be really worried. That stuff's super scary. You don't not want to be microdosing glyphosate at all, you know, but we are because we don't have a choice because it's in everything, you know, so what do you do? 
And so indigenous agriculture, you have to understand how widespread agriculture was in North America. Starting at the bottom of Mexico, shooting both north and south into the Americas, it goes all the way up through the entire Caribbean, the entire eastern seaboard, all the way up the Mississippi and Missouri River Valleys, and everywhere in between. You know, there is so much amazing agriculture that comes out of it. And you can trace the history of agriculture. It's fun because people living in Mexico, they had amazing farms, and they were feeding hundreds of thousands of people down there in massive civilizations and big cities, you know. And you can trace, like, how this agriculture moves northward. This is a Zuni farm in New Mexico where they figured out the waffle system, how to farm in the middle of the desert, right? Growing the same things that the Mexicans were growing down down further south again, you know, throughout Central America and everything. Because again, like the corn culture shoots both directions, and you have things like the Three Sisters Mound system, which is very unique to this particular region because you know you're growing the beans, you're growing the corn, which grow high. The beans crawl up the corn. The squash you plant on the outside it keeps out all the other things in a symbiotic growing system, but it's very unique to here. We had many kinds of different kinds of style of agriculture because there was much diversity out there. And like this is Buffalo Bird Woman. She's Hadatsa from North Dakota region today. You can see the Missouri River Valley behind her. And she's growing a row system, but growing, sorry, growing the same things that they were, oops, I'm going backwards. Where are you? There you go. But growing the same things that they were way, way down in Mexico, different varieties of corns and beans and squash and sunflowers and cotton and tobacco and all these things that crawl into different agricultural zones, right? And it's important to think that we have to be the stewards of, this, of these beautiful seeds because nobody else is going to be. And the big chemical companies, the big GMO companies, are trying to trademark all of these seeds because they want to control everything, you know? They want to do it through legal means to have complete control over all of your foods, basically. We have to do everything we can to keep these seeds in the hands of indigenous peoples. It's up to us to make that happen because there's so much beautiful, beautiful diversity still left alive and we should feel lucky what wasn't destroyed during that push in the 1800s when so much amazing agriculture was just wiped off the map completely, you know. So understanding how to how do we decolonize our food systems, you know? How do we pay homage to our, our past? How do we um, think about eating healthier? How do we think about using our land spaces wiser? You know, because indigenous foods truly are medicine to us, and we really can benefit from eating healthier stuff. And I did this slide already, but I'm gonna skip ahead, because like when I started this company, we just started taking our workers outside, you know, get connecting with the earth around us, you know, seeing the seeing the world around us for what it is with all these beautiful plants and flavors that we can be utilizing and starting to make our own pantry you know we don't have to buy everything from a grocery store there's so much amazing flavor around us that makes food taste like where we happen to be and I think that's a fun challenge for chefs to think about like use the world around us make the food taste like where we happen to live we don't need the exact same menu out there because we travel a lot we travel across the states I feel like we can write the menu every time before we walk in the door because everybody's got the same stuff you know you have some kind of bacon 6,000 calorie cheeseburger situation you have a Caesar salad, you have cauliflower to make it taste like buffalo wings. Like you just like everybody has the same stuff. You know, we need to be way more creative and understand how regional diversity works, right? And so like when we're making foods, we're just trying to make food taste like a place. We're using foods from that place. And like we know this is a picture of rabbit, cedar, cranberries, wild rice, maple. And if where I live in Minnesota, you can stand in one spot, look around and find all those ingredients around you, you know? And there's so much amazing create creativity that can come out of just this challenge, basically. If anybody's watched the, that Top Chef episode that Elena and I were on, where we challenged those chefs to like just try to make food taste like Wisconsin. You're in Wisconsin, so pay homage to the indigenous foods here, the indigenous cultures and peoples, and try to make something that tastes like here, you know? But we just really want to make this food normal. We want this food to be out there. We want all of our tribal communities to have access to this food because it's going to be healthier for them because the, our style of what we did with our philosophy of showcasing indigenous foods, removing European colonial ingredients, so taking away beef, pork, chicken, but also dairy, flour, cane sugar, things like that. So like opening up a restaurant that won best new restaurant in the entire nation without ranch dressing, like that's a huge feat, you know? <laughs> we were able to pull that off because it's possible. So indigenous food sovereignty is possible. It's healthier food access, it's cultural food producers, regional food systems, local control, which means non-governmental control, access to indigenous education, and environmental protections. We need these things to happen to be able to work towards that, you know? So our vision is, I keep putting this slide in here, but it's good for you, trust me. Um, 
my nonprofit is called Natives, North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems. And our whole goal is just to try to become an indigenous culinary support center to help this happen everywhere. Because you know, Owamni in Minnesota shouldn't be so unique. It shouldn't, we shouldn't be one of the few health-focused restaurants out there across the entire nation. We need every tribe to have access to this food. We need every tribe to be able to explore the creativity to define their culture any style that they want to. You know, like we took away fry bread in our cuisine just to showcase there was so much more, but that doesn't mean you can't, can't have it. Like it tastes good, it's fun, but there's other things out there that better identify us, you know? So our main goals are just creating access to indigenous foods and creating access to indigenous education. Um, so in Minneapolis, we built what is the Indigenous Food Lab, which has a market space, which we have over 50 different indigenous food producers with us right now. We have a production kitchen, which makes a lot of product. We have an education studio, which makes a lot of video stuff. And we have a food service concept, which is our restaurant in Wamney, because our restaurant's a part of the nonprofit too. And the reason the restaurant's in our nonprofit, because that's where our job force comes in. We're able to maintain over 100 employees at that restaurant throughout the year, and that grows to about 140 in the summertime. And 70% of our staff identifies as indigenous, so we're just creating a whole bunch of jobs for that particular thing, building a whole new generation of skills and just creative people. Um, and it, because it's a busy restaurant, it moves a ton of food through it, you know, because we're moving um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of, that's going directly to indigenous food producers. I just put an order in with Cheyenne River Bison um, because we're going to be in the state fair, Minnesota State Fair, which is one of the largest state fairs in the country. And just because we'll have to move like 120,000 units at that state fair. So I was like, hey, can I get an order of 40,000 pounds of bison? And they're like, yeah, no problem. But that's one order. That's one event, you know. And like we need more things to be able to do that, to be able to push that opportunity, that economic opportunity into a tribal producers. Because if we're going to be showcasing indigenous foods, let's make sure we're purchasing from indigenous peoples. Because otherwise you're just like buying everything from a Cisco or Aramark. And what does that really do? So be intentional about who we're purchasing foods from, you know. And so it's important to create this access. That's what the market's designed to do, is just create access. And we want to be able to create an access point in Minneapolis, but then branch out to all the tribal communities and make this access distribution happen directly into those communities. We want to tag along that education and just create more and more education of what it means to be, what indigenous education should look like, you know? And we have a lot of opportunities. So I think this is one of the videos that we're doing. Olis! I'm Anana Maya, and we are here at the Indigenous Food Lab Kitchen. Today we're going to be making sun cookies. Sun cookies is a recipe that comes together with only three ingredients. I have here about four cups of sunflower seeds, two cups of maple syrup, and a pinch of salt. So let's start. We're just making a ton of videos like that because we want to show people how easy it is to play with indigenous foods. And that education has to be a part of it because it's one thing if I hand somebody a couple pounds of dried corn, but will they know what to do with it, you know? So we have this beautiful technology of sharing this instantly. And so we just want to put QR codes on everything so people can have access to these recipes right off the back of the packages, you know? And we can be, I mean, it's really important for us to have that education, especially the younger generation where, you know, they're learning everything in 30 seconds bites with videos so quickly like we want to use that technology to get this information out there too it shouldn't be so hard just to put tons and tons of information out there for people education doesn't have to have a cost to it really you know education can be as simply as me telling you something or you telling me something you know but we have to have good education systems out there and we have to talk about real things you know so our goal is to prioritize purchase from indigenous producers locally and then nationally obviously there's so much creativity that can come out of this try making a dessert with Without dairy, wheat flour, or cane sugar, you know, that's like every dessert. But we can do it. We can be creative and we can make healthy dessert options too. And we just really want to push for this education to get out there in the communities. We want to help them find access to the seeds, to find access to people who know about indigenous farming techniques, you know, and permaculture techniques of just putting food everywhere, you know, because lawns are fucking stupid, right? We need to put food <laughs> everywhere possible. We need to just like stop growing lawns, put food places everywhere, you know, and that's possible. Otherwise, we end up with things like this. Palm Springs, 120 golf courses in the middle of the desert, right? The desert's not supposed to look like that. But if we can turn the desert into that, then it should be a food oasis. It shouldn't be a place to keep golfers' shoes clean, you know? We need to be able to, like, really be intentional about what we're doing, right? 
And then so like, oh, and it's possible to create businesses. My first food truck was Tatanka truck, you know, experimenting. And we didn't know what would happen if we opened up a cool native truck with no fry bread. Maybe we'd get run out of town, you know. But it worked. It worked. We were able to pull it off, you know. And eventually we opened up a Wamini. Oops, and I have another double slide. But our, our real goal is to branch out everywhere to create what we create in Minnesota with the food lab. So we're already moving into Bozeman, Montana to work in that region. But we have seeds planted in Anchorage, Alaska, um, Honolulu, in Oahu, Rapid City, South Dakota. We're looking at places, possibly Oklahoma, possibly California, finding pinpoints on the East Coast. We could do this everywhere. We can cross colonial borders. We can be in Canada. We can be down in Mexico. We can be in South America, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. There's indigenous peoples everywhere that need the same thing, you know? We have to push back against this, this normalization of what colonization has brought into our lives and start to really pull, understand a global diversity and the amazing knowledge that sits out there amongst all of us and from indigenous communities everywhere of how we could live closer to the earth and treat our environments better and to celebrate our diversities and stop trying to homogenize everything, you know? Because if we can control our food, we can control our destiny just much like our indigenous ancestors did on a global scale and it's important to think about that that global scale that worldwide scale because this isn't unique to North America this has happened across the globe and is still happening today in many places right now so what can we do today we can support indigenous initiatives locally or globally locally and globally call out cultural appropriation when you see it um, identify colonization in action support your fellow humans just be better humans is something of something we all can be better at create relationships with the plant world help dismantle white supremacy and it does not like being dismantled but we have to because it's uh, it's stupid to put one culture in front of everybody else because we're a global community we're all human equally together we have to create less trash the future will be indigenous, but we have to work together on it. We have to wake up, you know. We have to do things. We have to, co we have to combine all of our efforts together to make this happen. It's an important time in history, and we have to keep things moving forward, not backwards. So it's all up to us. Um, so thank you guys so much. If you want to contribute to our nonprofit, there's a QR code. Um,